I'm Leah Lane, an award-winning travel writer and author of Places I Remember, Tales, Truths, Delights from 100 Countries. On this podcast, we share conversations with travelers about fascinating destinations and memorable experiences around the world. On Places I Remember, we really enjoy interviewing adventure travelers. A few examples. On episode 21, high-altitude climber Jim Davidson describes summiting Mount Everest and dealing with an earthquake on the mountain. On episode 42, we talked with Deanne Birch, who moved to a remote Inuit village above the Arctic Circle. On episode 54, Sandra Smith shared about learning to sail at 43 and heading into the Pacific through storms and challenges, often alone. On episode 67, conservationist Paul Soshikzewski described quests in the jungles of Borneo, Laos, and other exotic destinations and a search for a mysterious white elephant. On this episode, we're talking to another great adventurer, Michael Finkel, one of the fortunate people who's known what he's wanted to do all his life. In a journal he kept at age 10, Mike noted that he wanted to be a writer when he grew up, and his second choice, he admits, was mad scientist. And a writer he has become, Michael has reported from over 50 countries with several best-selling books and countless articles in major publications. His newest book is The Art Thief, about Stefan Breitweiser, probably the most prolific art thief of all time. Welcome, Mike, to Places I Remember. I'm so honored to be here. Thanks, Lee. Well, you moved to France and got to know Stefan Breitweiser quite well. Was that why you moved there? No, I moved to France for the experience. Uh, I had three children in elementary school, and both my wife and I agreed that being able to speak a second language really fluently is a great gift and opens up your mind. And maybe that was the reason, another culture, another language. So we moved from the mountains of Montana to the south of France, and that was in 2014, and lived in the south of France full-time for seven years. What did you find... Being an expat, what was the thing that surprised you, maybe? I love the fact that you have a podcast completely dedicated to travel. And I feel like travel itself is partially a mindset, partially something real. I feel like I could go to 7-Eleven a mile from my house and consider that a trip. And I could go to the middle of France. It is, and in the same way, so when you ask, what is it like to be an expat? I have this funny sort of feeling. I've always traveled. My parents didn't get to travel when they were growing up. As soon as they had children, they started traveling. So it was funny. I feel like my parents were also sort of wide-eyed, inexperienced travelers. And I grew up with this, let's figure it out. But I also have this funny feeling that I, I don't actually feel like I'm traveling or an expat very often. I, I feel that I am always on my home planet. Therefore, I'm always home. Like, you know, it. yes, of course. As soon as I opened my mouth in France, people knew that I wasn't from France. I guess maybe the most difficult thing about being an expat is that you do feel that there is a little bit more people sort of looking at you. <laughs> That's a common thing when you travel. Sometimes it can be a little bit exhausting. I think speaking another language is a little tiring, especially if you're not fluent in it and you have to work at it. And, you know, I like to be witty at a dinner party. And if it's a dinner party in French, I don't want to be less witty. But I, <laughs> It'll I sound better in French. <laughs> <laughs> tiring, but also sort of, uh, like I said, literally going to the local boulangerie and making small talk with a woman working there felt like a small journey unto itself. So if you like the frisian and excitement of traveling, it's sort of constant when, you, when you're an expert. Pat. Even I remember having like conferences with the school teachers, of course, all in French. And even the smallest things were like semi-struggle, semi-adventure. And if you have the right mindset, then you're going to thrive on that. And if you're the type of person who is more of a homebody, then that might not be the most comfortable situation for you. But luckily, I am the former category. You are. Well, you started as a ski rider and you've skied all over the world. What are some of your favorite ski adventures or memories. Yes, I'm a ski rider and I skied all over the world, but really I just thought of my skis as a giant set of skeleton keys that opened doors all over the world. I think my ski magazine editor might not be happy to hear this, but 99% of the reason why I skied all over the world had nothing to do with skiing. It was just an excuse to go somewhere. Um, I know that. Because I was, you know, 22 year old kid without a lot of cash. If someone's going to buy me a plane ticket. So yes, in terms of skiing, oh my gosh, I skied off the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro. I put my skis in the back of someone's house and, and traveled in Tanzania. I skied in Iran where the slopes were divided between men's slopes and women's slopes 
slopes, but really I put my skis in a locker and traveled through Iran. I skied one of the earliest ski slopes to open in China. But I also spent five more weeks traveling through China. So I used my pair of skis as a very bulky piece of baggage. But really, it was just a way to open up right. uh, other, other cultures. Like a and, business trip. A lot of business travelers do that. They go on business and it's an excuse to see the world, which is very good. And some business travelers don't do that. They just go for business and don't add that time. And it's a shame. I always acknowledge how fortunate I am. And, and again, I totally understand if... Some people are wired differently. In fact, if everyone was the same type of traveler, I would be disappointed if everyone traveled like me, because I do like the fact that it makes it relatively easy to get off the beaten path. If you're uncomfortable and all you like to eat is pizza, then I, I understand not wanting to travel in China. I would go to Naples, but yeah. Anyway, let's focus today on some of your travel adventures and memorable destinations. You gave me a list. I mean, this is just a starting point. I'm just going <laughs> to... How about Alaska? You... So I spent... Um, about 20 years of my life before I moved to France, living in Montana, I really love the mountains. And I'm a person who loves winter, which is probably the least popular season. Also, I mentioned that I like to get off the beaten path. So maybe I like to get off the beaten season. Living in Montana, we used to refer to the rest of the United States as the lower 47. <laughs> Never uh, but heard my that. Okay. My next door neighbor said, if you really like winter, you like to experience the mountains, then you're basically living in AAA baseball here in Montana. If you want to see what it's really like, go to Alaska. I traveled to Alaska probably my first time. I was 22 years old and it blew my mind, the scales, the scope of it all. And I probably went to Alaska 10 different times. And I'd say by far my most memorable experience. Now, when I talk about travel, sometimes I have this funny little thing in my mind, which is called the, the absolute value of experience, meaning What's your richest memories? What's the best trips is the one that affected you the most. So you come back and you're most powerfully moved. Now, sometimes an extraordinarily positive experience, of course, that's amazing, but also an extraordinarily negative experience Absolutely. is extremely powerful. They make the best stories afterwards. <laughs> no doubt. This is way before world's most dangerous catch. I got a job on a fishing boat. Your son knows all about this, Lee. Yes, uh, you did not mention that I have been friends with Randall support. Or, uh, since we were teenagers, literally. Uh, I actually met you once uh, when you were roommates way back. Oh, yeah, of course. For a minute. <laughs> yeah, I got a job on a crab fishing boat in the Bering Sea in Alaska in January, in which I worked, no exaggeration, 20 hours a day for several weeks, hard physical labor, one of the absolute worst experiences of my life, but yet it brought me to the limits physically, mentally, psychologically, and I got paid. I got 2% of the catch. I wow. literally went and worked on a boat and... My proudest moment was after we did a complete season of a paleo known as snow crab in the restaurants. The captain of the ship said, Mike, I'd have you back for another season. And I said, no, thank you. I'm, I got very soft hands. I'm a writer. To this day, I like I, I mentally pat myself on the back thinking, I, you know, I worked an extremely rugged physical job and was actually invited back rather than fired. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I, I worked on the marine vessel, the MV Notorious chartered out of Iceland. This was not any sort of dispensation for being a journalist. And that was my most memorable. This is way before that TV show came out. I'll never forget the experience. And I think neither will my lower back. <laughs> well, you've tested your limits there and came through. Proud of you. What about yeah. Afghanistan? First time I went to Afghanistan was uh, about three weeks after September 11th. I had a few years where I worked as a combat journalist, interested in the reasons why people would kill each other. I couldn't consider that any sort of travel destination. So I was in Afghanistan from October 2001 for the better part of six months. At the time, uh, there were no ATMs or credit cards accepted. I think I came in with 10,000 US dollars stuck in my belt, in the soles of my shoes. And I traveled with photographer and experienced what it was like to exist in the middle of a very undefined war, the Northern Alliance versus the Taliban. There were a lot of U.S. soldiers around. I was not embedded in the military like other journalists were. I had fascinating experiences in a country where there no hotels, so you had to find someone who was willing to put you up. So many memories from that. What Again, did you my, learn about yourself there? I think I'm learning about myself on a daily basis. 
being non-embedded and spending a lot of time with Taliban soldiers, people that were literally trying to kill Americans. I think what I learned most is that, uh, first of all, my theory of humanity, which has been unchanged for 30 years of constant travel, is that 99.9% .9 of us are really good people at heart, that the world is actually not a dangerous place. And I think the more people who travel will tell you both of those things. Almost everyone is kind and almost everywhere is safe, including Afghanistan in the middle of a war. What do they say? One, one drop of poison, you have to spill out the whole gallon of milk. Mm -hmm. And so that's the real reason why there's any trouble in the world at all is very tiny percentage of people. And so the same holds with Afghanistan. Almost everyone I met was beautiful, fed me. There was no restaurants really put me up. And I think what I learned mostly is that you are a product of your upbringing. If I had been born in a certain part of Afghanistan and went to a madrasa and was exposed to the learning. I might've fought against the United States as well. And so open-mindedness and understanding of one's journey through life was really the thing that most struck me about my travels in Afghanistan. Like, oh, don't you hate this person who's fighting with the Taliban? Well, no, I, I, I don't actually. And there are terrible people in this world and I have encountered some of them, unfortunately, even like a Taliban soldier firing on U.S. soldiers, and I don't care how outre this sounds, is not necessarily a, a bad person right. once you get to right. know them. There are many great movies with that theme, many World War I, World War II movies where you, you see that, but you've experienced it. Right. How about Italy? Tell us about so I lived in France, as I mentioned, for seven years, and the thing that rankled the French people the most in my time in France, and especially as I got to speak the language better and realize that I could be just as jocular in French as I can be in English, is saying how much I loved the cuisine in Italy more, oh. than, more than France, to be oh. honest with you. So we lived a two-hour drive from the Italian border, and all I thought about most of my time living in France was how can I get to Italy again? Funny, when you live in Europe, you know, it's like going to another state in the United States, how we would sometimes like, let's go to dinner in Italy. It is a cliche, but I will eat in any corner the restaurant in, in Italy and uh, this is one of those things where sometimes the the cliche travel is also the truly beautiful, like the Amalfi Coast in in Italy, ah. the Incaterra, the tiny villages that, like, if you have not been to the west coast of Italy, it's almost like a dream, and yet it's it also is. real, and they're not tr trying to make it set up for tourists. And... Did you know I wrote guidebooks on the Amalfi Coast, and I uh, had to go back to update them all the time. What a uh, terrible thing. Of course. <laughs> yeah, that was my favorite part of and, the and Speaking of guidebooks, which I use all the time, I got back from Japan yesterday. That's an 11 hour time change from where I am. By the way, 12 hour time change is the maximum because you're going one way or another. So almost wow. maximum. I have ways of coping with jet lag. Ignore it. <laughs> the little mind over matter. If you think it's midnight, but it's seven in the morning, don't go to bed. Have breakfast. I agree. Just keep going. Yeah, just pretend it doesn't exist. You'll anymore. sleep eventually. A little mind over body. Uh, well, you're which... doing very well with jet lag right now, I have to say. <laughs> so Japan. No I memory. just got back less than 24 hours ago. So this was my third trip to Japan. It was so reasonably priced. Oh my goodness, the dollar really? is strong. Unique travel experience for me. My daughter, my oldest child just graduated from high school and it was a father-daughter trip to Japan. Oh, nice. Just the two of us. And that was a first for me travel traveling with my child for nine days and we ate our way through Japan. I have an adventurous eating daughter, I guess. That's did, you, from did you have blowfish where you could be poisoned if you are? We did not have any did food. I have. <laughs> the funny thing about travel is this. I haven't been to Botswana. That's one place I haven't been to. If I go to Botswana for three weeks, I'll come back and now there's a hundred places I haven't been to because there's little details. So the more you travel, the less you've seen in a funny sort of way. There's no sure. end to it. So now I haven't had Fugu. I haven't climbed Mount Fuji. There's like 17 places in Tokyo that were on hurry my Hurry up, hurry up. <laughs> I didn't get to see. This is not like collecting a baseball card set. The idea of travel is truly endless. The guidebook that you write is, it starts becoming out of date the moment exactly. you put the Exactly. That's why you have to go back. And that's why I was so happy in the Amalfi Coast. How about Haiti? You have an amazing story there. I have a very soft spot in my heart for Haiti, which is very close to the United States, and yet perhaps the most challenging, most difficult country to travel in in the world. So right 
off the coast wow. of Miami. I've reported from 50 countries. I've probably been in 100 countries. I do not know of a single country on planet Earth that is in a more difficult situation than Haiti. And so if you want to have your eyes not just open, but ridiculously opened, travel in Haiti is not for those who highly regard safety. Almost everyone is kind and will treat you well. And I will never forget there's a soundtrack to the streets of Port-au-Prince that is etched in my mind. Funny sounds. It's like, I remember like the World Cup in South Africa many years ago when everyone was blowing in those strange trumpets. And I still hear that in my head, but the soda vendors in Port-au-Prince, they have a, like a soda opener and they bang it against these bottles and there's there's hundreds of them going around. And I think about people beating on the sides of glass bottles with an opener and there's really interesting sound that seemed unique to Port-au-Prince. That's it, a sound memory. Your trip on the boat is something you've written about. I'm a journalist. This is not Euro Disney, the Eiffel Tower, and get on a Haitian no. a refugee boat. But, but I, it's yes, unbelievable story. I did, I did document the struggles that, that some people are willing to take to get to the United States. Uh, I did purchase a seat on a refugee boat. It was a 23-foot-long boat made completely out of wood. Five people could comfortably fit on a 23-foot boat, and there were 46 of us. 43 of us were crammed in a dank hold. Lee, I got to tell you of all the experiences I've had traveling that one, I was uh, no kidding concerned about its potentially dire outcome. Yeah. And the boat actually uh, was foundering in the water and was uh, sinking. We were actually rescued by the United States Coast Guard. In my life, I've been rescued by United States military forces two separate times. When some people say to a soldier, thank you for your service, the United States military has saved my life in Haiti and also in Afghanistan. I don't want to make things any darker, but there was a very terrible incident in which a room in which I was staying with about 20 other journalists was uh, attacked and two people were killed in the same room that I was sleeping in. And I uh, dove out a window and ran to a U.S. Army base. They took me in. For people listening, you're not supposed to be taking notes here and say, oh, well, let's do this and this. This is my to-do list. No, this is not a cruise. <laughs> This is something that interesting to hear, and we learn from it and admire that you have the capacity to cover all of these and to keep your spirit and it's heartwarming to hear that you feel that people are good because there is so much. You you covered conflicts in Israel, I know, as well. This was the 2000 during the second intifada and both the sadness, current events sort of replaying in my mind. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And you could literally read in the Bible about the Israelites and the Philistines, and now you have the Israelis and the Palestinians. You know, it's only a conflict that's been going on for a couple of thousand years. Yeah. And once again, I'm Jewish and I lived in Gaza City for more than a month without leaving the confines of the Gaza Strip. And again, was treated by most people extremely kindly. People like to share their stories. Sometimes I'm surprised that things haven't gone completely sideways. When you said to me, you think that most people are good, I don't just think it, I, I actually know it. Good to hear. It would take a lot to disabuse me of that notion. It's just the exceptions that get a lot of press. Well, here's an exception. In Central Africa, you documented the impact of animal poachers. What's your feeling there? in terms of good. I don't know if you've ever been really hungry. Desperate situations, you don't really know what you would do. Especially with a family. Yeah, again, this is maybe the journalist in me or the yeah. human in me, but I try not to judge. Now, yes, I think that someone who's going to kill an elephant for a hunk of ivory is in no way performing anything good, but I know bankers who make money off of other people's bankruptcies. I don't think that's particularly good either. That's not only legal, but celebrated. The world is all shades of gray. Okay. Now you cross the Sahara with migrant workers. All I remember is uh, I jumped on the back of a truck that was crossing the Sahara for three days. It was fascinating. A couple of things we would, um, uh, mostly Muslim uh, migrants. And so the, the truck would stop five times a day so everyone could pray. And I would crawl underneath the truck to sit in the shade. But the thing I remember most about that trip, there was maybe 75 people on a pretty big dump truck. We were all crammed in. And for dinners, amazing. There was this huge birdbath-sized bowl of the group of maybe 20 people I was closest with. Each group of 20 had this huge bowl. And everyone would dig around in their belongings. Like, oh, I found a can of tuna fish. Or I had some sardines. We would all dump it in this bowl, mix it together, and eat with our left hands. 
and we would all share from this communal bowl, whatever we could come up with. And I've eaten at some Michelin starred restaurants, but I've probably not had any more memorable meals than sharing a bowl with 19 of my favorite uh, migrant workers. None of us who shared a, a language, putting our hands into the same bowl in the middle of the, the Sahara desert in a scorching day. In the Congo, you work for National Geographic magazine. You spent time with field scientists on a volcano. Anything there to <laughs> reflect on? We've spoken a lot about humans and my encounters with them. But I also, you know, I'm speaking to you from Park City. I mentioned that I lived in Bozeman, Montana. Let's not forget the amazing wonders of the natural world, which also, I mean, I love being in crowded places, conflicts. To write, to work, I need to be in a place that's quiet and peaceful. Some of the most amazing things I've ever seen in my life include the Northern Lights, full solar eclipse. Just saw the one in, in April. I had great fortune to descend into an active volcano to see like a lake of lava. And it always makes me feel as does just simply laying on my back on a clear night. When I see the stars, it makes me feel both extraordinarily significant and completely insignificant. And I do love that tug of war in my mind. And uh, I think the word sublime, and when it comes to something that's overwhelming in its beauty and its nature, and you feel forces so much greater than you that while uh, seeing uh, Niriagongo, one of the world's most active volcanoes, which is in uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Wow. Well, let me just ask you, the name of the podcast is Places I Remember. You've given us many memorable experiences. I think I talked to you about my absolute value of travel theory. Extremes of emotion or feelings are what I seek. I'm going to end with what was the worst trip of my life, therefore perhaps the most profound. Like you mentioned earlier in this wonderful free-ranging conversation, I've been in Afghanistan, Haiti, covered conflicts in the Middle East tried to climb an 8,000 meter peak in Tibet, been tortured in many ways. And as you probably can gather, lots of energy and I'm a journalist, so therefore I am a outgoing person. I decided that I would do a 10 day silent meditation retreat at the Dhammagiri Meditation Center in India. 10 days of not just silence, you couldn't even make eye contact with anyone. You couldn't bring anything to read. And I am an invertebrate reader. You couldn't bring a pen or a pencil. I, I've kept a journal for 30 years. 10 days that included hours and hours a day of sitting on a cushion doing guided meditation. I cannot tell you the depth of how difficult that was for me. It was the most I hated it in a level that was so deep, and yet there was no chains attaching me. I could have left at any moment, and that also made it harder. If I was literally locked up, it might have been easier. Within 24 hours, every fiber of my being wanted to run out of the Dhammagiri Meditation Center. I managed to stay completely silent without any distractions for uh, 240 hours for 10 wow. of the most difficult days of my life. Some people thought it was the absolutely most fulfilling experience, and I will never forget the difficulty of that. To explore the, the outer world is amazing, and to explore the inner world is no less vast. If you are at all interested in challenging yourself, a Vipassana meditation, 10 days, and here's what I love about Vipassana meditation, the cost of a 10-day retreat is precisely zero. It is such a pure form of meditation. The Buddha himself used Vipassana meditation to achieve enlightenment. That's how old it is. And it's so well respected. The people that teach these courses, which are all around the world, do it for free. A trip that cost me nothing in which the entire itinerary was do nothing was the absolute most challenging trip of my life. Wow. Well, you do lead an amazing life. And you're a young man, relatively. You have a lot left to go. And I can only imagine where wisdom will add to this as you get older. It's just incredible to hear it, let alone to think of living it. Your best-selling award-winning book, The Art Thief, is a great read. And it will be coming out as a movie, correct? <laughs> I speak better French than I speak Los Angeles. You know, it's, it's been option to the movies. Let's see. Okay, well, I crap. recommend Please, it. <laughs> I recommend it. I look forward to seeing it and reading whatever you write next. You're a great journalist. Keep on traveling, living life to the fullest. You inspire us to push our own limits. Thank you so much, Mike Finkel. My absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening to our award-winning podcast. We've recorded over 100 episodes of Places I Remember. 
So follow us on any podcast app. And new monthly episodes are also on YouTube with gorgeous video. My book, Places I Remember, is available in print and Kindle, and I read the audio version. Follow my travel writing at Forbes.com. Contact me at the links in the show notes or on my website, PlacesIRememberLealane.com, and keep making your own travel memories. <music>